Good afternoon. I want to thank you again for your interest in staying with us during the series of Bible lectures. If you're anything like me, you have greatly benefited from this day of Bible study, from this day of communing with other Christians, encouraging and meeting other Christians from all across the country and all across the world. And we're going to continue on. We only have a few more lessons left. We have, uh, I think, three more left before we finish. Um, actually, the third one is Mark Roberts, who's going to finish with us at the 7 o'clock hour. It's 5 o'clock now which means we're going to go to Ben Lee, who preaches with the West Main Church of Christ in Louisville, Texas. And I have to tell you right now, Ben is probably one of the most positive and uplifting human beings you'll ever meet in your life. He's also one of the most active. Not only is he a full-time preacher, he has a family, uh, a beautiful wife and child. He's also very active online. He has a website. He has a blog. He has a podcast. He has books on Amazon. He has everything. He also, I think, does some personal coaching on the side uh, with what little free time he has. Uh, ben is a is a worker. He's a go-getter. He's an uplifting. He's a positive person. And he is the perfect person to speak on the topic that he's chosen, which is called an unusual response to suffering. All of us, to a certain extent, are suffering right now. And it's sometimes for some people, it's a lot. Some people, it's a little. But all of us are suffering to a certain extent. And all of us have a response to that. And I'm really excited to share with you Ben's lesson that will help us cope with this during that during this time period called an unusual response to suffering. Hello and welcome. I hope and pray all is well with you. I'm Benjamin Lee. Thank you so much for taking this time to do this special study with us as we continue to keep our minds and thoughts on the Word of God and our great Father in Heaven. I want to begin by taking you back to 2012. I believe it was either 2012 or 2013. One Sunday, Sunday morning, after services were concluded, at that time I was in Beaumont, Texas, there was a young man that reached out to one of the brothers there. He had been there in attendance that morning, and he had a request. He wanted us to reach out to his mother. His mother's name was Karen. Well, that initial request would turn into something really great. We would find out or come to learn to find out that his mother, Karen, well, she had a big problem. She had cancer and she didn't have that much time left to live. Her son was a Christian. He wanted someone to talk to her, to share the good news of Jesus Christ with her. So in the process of time, we reached out to his mother, Karen. We asked if we could come over and visit her and, and, and have a Bible study with her and she agreed to it. I think if I were to ask uh, some of the other people who were there with me at the time, my wife, Nikki, she was there, uh, and some of the other members also went over there to, to meet her and to study with her, I think they would all say the same thing, that she was a special lady. She was very kind in nature. And even though she didn't have a lot of time left, her heart was open. She was receptive to learning more about God. She had shared with us that years earlier, she had gone to a congregation, I can't remember which one she had named, and while she had gone to church growing up, she had not really learned that much about the Word of God. So this was our opportunity to give her something, something very important, the good news of Jesus and what she needed to do to be saved. So after about at least maybe four to six weeks Karen made the decision one day that she wanted to put on Christ in baptism. It was a great day. I remember it. It was cold. It was in the afternoon. And we had to pick her up and take her to the building. At the time, uh, when I was preaching at the Down Road Church of Christ in Beaumont, Texas, our baptistry is, is the baptistry there was upstairs. And there are a large amount of stairs that you had to, to walk up to get there. Well, Karen was very weak. She had cancer and she just didn't have that much strength. I didn't know if we were actually going to be able to, to go through with it all because it took quite a long time for us just to get her up the stairs. We had to sit her down on one of the steps and then pull her up on the next step and we just kept doing that. So it took a great amount of time. After we finally got her upstairs, the sisters who were there had to... Had to um, undress her and get her ready so that we could go ahead and baptize her. So from getting her up all the way upstairs to actually baptizing her and then taking her back downstairs, it took at least about 45 minutes. But the good news is that she obeyed the gospel. Karen was saved. Her sins have been washed away. 
by the blood of Jesus. With the strength that she had over the next month, two months, she would do her best to come to worship services. And it was a short time after that that eventually Karen died. I, I'm sharing this story with you because, one, it's a powerful story for me. I will never forget Karen. And I think there's some valuable lessons that all of us can learn. One of the big thoughts that I had just studying with Karen and remembering what happened is how her heart was still receptive to hearing God's word. Someone gave her an opportunity. Her son gave her an opportunity by reaching out to other people who might be able to have an impact upon her. And that's something that I think is very important for us to know that there are people out in the world who are willing to listen and obey if we give them an opportunity to hear the word of God. The second big thing, though, that really stands out to me with this story is the fact that even though her son saw his mother suffering, there was still something bigger that he was thinking about. I can only imagine the pain that he was feeling at that time, seeing what she was going through. But he wanted her to be saved. And in the midst of suffering, his mind was still on helping her to become right with God. I think that's something really powerful. And I'm bringing, this all, I'm bringing all of this up because we're in the midst of suffering. We're going through something in this world with the COVID-19 coronavirus that we have never experienced before. And sadly, there are many people who are, who are suffering, who are hurting, who have been affected, physically affected by the virus. But all of our world has been changed. All of our lives have been changed as a result of the coronavirus. Yet, even in the midst of difficult days, even in the midst of suffering, there's something that we all, I think, should do. That is still remaining focused on evangelism. I bring all of this up because looking back at Karen and how she responded, how her son responded, thinking about her, and just other people that I have met in my life. There's a, a brother in Christ back in Beaumont, Texas, who for years has had a number of health issues. And yet he's on fire when it comes to reaching the lost. He wants to talk to people. He makes it his mission to talk to people over and over again. His mind, even though he is suffering, his mind is still focused on God's great work. Even in the midst of suffering, I believe that we need to respond in what could be called an unusual way, at least for some, and that is still keeping our mind focused on doing the work of God. I bring all of that up because when you open up your Bible and look in the New Testament, and if you have your Bible with you, please open it up, please, to uh, Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, we know that Peter and the apostles on the day of Pentecost, they preached the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The Bible says in Acts chapter 2, in verse number 41, So then those who had received his word were baptized, and that day they were added, uh, there were added about 3,000 souls. 3,000 souls is something really powerful to think about. In Acts chapter 4, the Bible says, but in verse number 4, But many of those who had heard the message believed, and the number of the men came to be about 5,000 we see that the gospel was spreading. The apostles were boldly preaching Jesus Christ crucified. Yet it didn't take a long time for them to begin to face opposition. It didn't take a long time for them to begin to be persecuted. In fact, when you look at Acts chapter 4 and verse number 1, the Bible says, As they were speaking to the people, the priest and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to them, being greatly disturbed because they were teaching the people and proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection from the dead. And they laid hands on them and put them in jail until the next day, for it was already evening. So now Peter and John are in jail for proclaiming the word of God. But even in the midst of suffering, they're not going to stop. They're going to continue to stay focused upon God's great work. When you get over to Acts chapter 5, we see that the intensity uh, from, those, uh, from those in the world would continue to rise against the apostles and the work that they were doing. In Acts chapter 5 and verse number 40, the Bible says, They took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, 
They flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus and then released them. But what did they do? Even in the midst of suffering, what do we find? So they went on their way from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. I love that. They could have just stopped in the midst of their sorrow and pain, physical pain, but they didn't. Instead, they focused on planting and sharing the word of God. Their sorrow did not stop them from sharing God's great message, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Even in Acts chapter 7, if you recall this man by the name of Stephen, we are introduced to him in Acts chapter 6 and verse number 5. And he was one of the men that, were, that was chosen, one of the seven men that was chosen to address the issue that was taking place there in the church. Well, when we pick up the story in Acts chapter 7, sadly, we see that Stephen is going to be killed. He had been preaching the word of God to the Jews, and yet they're going to stone him and put him to death. The Bible says in Acts 7 and verse 54, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the quick, and they began gnashing their teeth at him. But being full of the Holy Spirit, he gazed intently into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. And he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and covered their ears and rushed at him with one impulse. When they had driven him out of the city, they began stoning him, and the witnesses laid aside their robes at the feet of a young man named Saul. They went on stoning Stephen as he called on the Lord and said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then falling on his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Having said this, he fell asleep. Now I want you to notice something. In Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 1, it says, Saul was in hearty agreement with putting him to death. And on that day, a great persecution began against the church in Jerusalem. The apostles had been persecuted. Now Stephen had been persecuted. Now a great persecution against the church in Jerusalem was taking place. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. Some devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul began ravaging the church, entering house after house, and dragging off men and women. He put them in prison. Now listen to what the Bible says next. In Acts 8 and verse number 4, Therefore those who have been scattered went about preaching the word. Don't you just love that? Even in the midst of suffering, what did they do? They, are, they were still focusing on God's great work. I believe that is often an unusual response to suffering because suffering is very difficult. One of the biggest questions that people often ask with respect to God and the scriptures is with the problem of suffering. And there are many things that we could talk about. There are many sermons that could be done, many Bible classes that could be done with respect to the issue of suffering. But one of the things that really impresses me with the disciples in the first century, is that they had this response that even when their lives was, were turn, was turned upside down, their minds were still focused on others. They were still focused on doing the great work of God. As you think about what's taking place in our world, not just here in America, but all around the world, everyone is going through something at this very moment. And I certainly do not mean to take lightly the suffering of someone. I have no idea what so many people are going through. And I don't, I don't, I certainly don't want to come across as you thinking that I'm not being sensitive to, to what people may be experiencing. There are many people who are suffering in a variety of ways, but I do want to call to your attention that as a people of God, a response that we should have is the same kind of response that these Christians had in the first century. It could often be described as an unusual response, but nonetheless, it is a response, and I believe there's great benefit not only for us, but also for people in the world. When you think about how they responded, the first thought I want you to think about when it comes to us, 
One of the benefits of responding in this manner is that our focus is not going to be so much on our problems, but rather on the power of God. Our focus won't be so much on our problems, but rather on the power of God. When you think about what the Christians were doing here, their lives were turned upside down. They're scattered. Everything changed in an instant. Yet they would be reminded about God's great power as they went out teaching and proclaiming the word of God. We find many of the Christians that, that in the first century, that's exactly what they did. If you continue on in Acts chapter 8 and verse number 5, the Bible says, Philip went down to the city of Samaria. This is the Philip that we read about or read about in Acts chapter 6. He was one of the seven men that was appointed along with Stephen. No doubt, Philip, he was carrying that burden of losing someone close to him with respect to Stephen. But what do we find Philip doing? In the midst of great suffering, he's still doing the will of God, the work of God. Philip went down to the city of Samaria in verse 5 and began proclaiming Christ to them. The crowds with one accord were giving attention to what was said by Philip as they heard and saw the signs which he was performing. For in the case of many who had unclean spirits, they were coming out of them shouting with a loud voice and many who had been paralyzed and lame were healed. So there was much rejoicing in that city. Then we read about a man by the name of Simon, and Philip is going to convert this man. In verse number 12, the Bible says, But when they believed Philip preaching the good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were being baptized, men and women alike. Even Simon himself believed. And after being baptized, he continued on with Philip. And as he observed signs and great miracles taking place, he was constantly amazed. Despite his pain and despite the loss of Stephen, no doubt Philip, as he went about doing God's great work, he would also be reminded about the power of God. His focus wasn't so much on the suffering. No doubt he had experienced suffering as well, but on preaching the gospel, on proclaiming the good news, and he would be reminded about God's great power. As we think about the suffering that we go through, and what we are enduring at this very moment. And no doubt about it, it is going to be very challenging looking at the next few weeks and the next month and who knows what else what the future holds. But as we think about the future, one of the best things that we can do is keep our minds focused on the power of God. And what better way than sharing with others the power of God, what it is that Jesus has done, the miracles that he performed, the fact that he has risen from the grave and has ascended back into heaven at the right hand of God and that all men and women can be forgiven through his great and precious blood. This response, although it may be unusual for many, is a great way for us to respond in the midst of suffering because it will help us to remember God's great power. But the benefit is not just for us. The benefit is also for those that we're talking to, right? Because we want to make sure that people are prepared. When you look at what's taking place in the world right now, preparation is something that is very important. People are thinking about what's going to happen next week and two weeks from now. People are taking the, the necessary precautions and measures when it comes to grocery shopping or social distancing and so many other things. People want to be prepared now more than ever. But you know what else people need to be prepared for? Eternity. People need to be prepared. They need to know that one day, that one day they are going to have to stand before God. I'm turning it over to Hebrews chapter 9. In Hebrews chapter 9 and verse number 27. In Hebrews 9 and verse 27, the Bible says, And inasmuch as it is appointed for men to die once, and after this comes judgment. Brothers and sisters, people need to be prepared for judgment day. We are all standing on the edge of eternity. What's been taking place with the coronavirus is a reminder that we certainly do not know what a day holds. I'm thinking about James chapter 4. If you want to turn over there in James chapter 4, James chapter 4, verse number 13. James said, come now you who say today or tomorrow, 
we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. Isn't that true? We've been reminded that the word of God is true. We don't know what tomorrow is going to be like. We don't know what a day holds. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. People need to be prepared for eternity. We have exactly what they need, the good news of Jesus Christ. So this is another reason for us that even in the midst of suffering, it's an opportunity for us to respond in what be, may be in the eyes of many an unusual way by doing the great work of God and teaching as many people as we can about Jesus Christ. One of the benefits for those in the world that we reach out to, obviously, is the preparation for them, being, being prepared to stand before God and, and to give them hope. What people need more than ever is hope. And there's a passage I want to share with you in Acts chapter 16. In Acts chapter 16, verse number 25, Actually, let's pick up the story a little bit prior to uh, verse number 25. In Acts chapter 16, we find Paul and Silas. They were doing the work of God. Earlier in Acts chapter 16 and verse number 12, as they were in Philippi, they, they went to, uh, according to verse number 13, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to a riverside where we were supposing that there would be a place of prayer. And we sat down and began speaking to the women who had assembled. A woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple fabrics, a worshiper of God, was listening. And the Lord opened her heart to respond to the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household had been baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come into my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. They were converting lost souls. And yet they would face persecution. Later on in Acts chapter 16, in Acts chapter 16 and verse 22, the Bible says the crowd rose up together against them and the chief magistrates tore their robes off them and proceeded to order them to be beaten with rods. When they had struck them with many blows, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to guard them securely. And he, having received such a command, threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. But about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns of praise to God. There's another unusual response when it comes to suffering, right? They were worshiping God. We need to remember that as well. Our schedules have been, have, have just totally changed, but that doesn't stop us from continuing to worship our great God in heaven. Let's make sure that that is a response that is natural for us, that we continue to do and so they're praying and singing hymns of praise to God and the prisoners were listening to them. And suddenly there came a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison house were shaken. And immediately all the doors were open and everyone's chains were unfastened. When the jailer awoke and saw the prison doors open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself. This man, this man had no hope. He knew that he knew what he was about to face thinking about and, and, and assuming that the prisoners had escaped. But watch what Paul and Silas did. Supposing that the prisoners had escaped, but Paul cried out with a loud voice saying, do not harm yourself for we are all here. Paul was still thinking about this man. He knew what this man was about to do. He knew that this man needed some help. That's what so many people need today. What people need today is hope. And we have that to give to them through Jesus Christ and, and, what we, and what all men can enjoy through his great sacrifice on the, cross, on the cross and the fact that he has risen from the grave. Paul and Silas, or Paul cried out to this man and he said, don't harm yourself. In verse 29, he called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. And after he brought them out, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's a powerful story. I believe it's just a great reminder for us that when it comes to the suffering that we face, whatever that suffering may be, that we still need to respond by thinking about 
how we might be able to help others, and how we might be able to share the good news of Jesus Christ with those who are in need. What people need, they need hope, true hope, and something that is going to remain constant no matter what we face in this world. We can give them that. We can share with them the good news of Jesus Christ. And so Paul and Silas are going to teach this man. He is going to hear the word and he's going to certainly believe in Jesus Christ and the fact that he is risen from the grave. And he's going to be baptized for the forgiveness of his sins. And he's going to be saved. And I love the response after this. He, him and his entire household. The Bible says in verse number 32, verse number 31, they said, Believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him together with all who were in his house. And he took them that very hour of the night and washed their wounds. And immediately he was baptized, he and all his household. And he brought them into his house and set food before them and rejoiced. That's a powerful thought for us to consider, isn't it? That even in this great midst of suffering, we still can give people something and that they can rejoice about salvation through Jesus Christ. He rejoiced greatly, it says, having believed in God with his whole household. An unusual response in the midst of suffering is keeping our minds focused on our God in heaven and his great work, reaching out to those who are in need of his salvation. Now, it's very easy for us to talk about this, and yet it can be very challenging to do because when suffering happens, it can be very easy for us to withdraw and where we feel like we want to just kind of retreat and just kind of be in our own little bubble. But when we think about what the saints in the first century went through, Paul and Silas worshiping God, even in prison at midnight, thinking about that man who was in need, who was about to harm himself, Peter and John, the other apostles, Philip, Stephen, the saints who were scattered, even in the midst of great suffering, they still did the work of God. That should be an encouragement for us. I believe that talking about and, and, and thinking about others is often very unusual because it's just so easy just to be consumed with ourselves. But let's keep our minds focused on God and let's remember the good that we can still do in this world when we consider those who are in need. Evangelism, I think we can say, is often an unusual response to suffering. But maybe we make it so common that no one would ever think that. Now, as we think about evangelism, as we think about what's taking place here with the coronavirus, a lot of things have changed. Many people are not meeting together at the building each first day of the week, but that doesn't mean that the work of God stops. With the rest of my time, I just want to share with you a couple of thoughts with something that all of us can do, things all of us can do when it comes to reaching those who are in need of the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have a statement uh, that I use quite a bit, and it's called, it's not rocket science. When I start talking about evangelism, I often say it's not rocket science. There are simple things that all of us can do to reach the lost, even, even in the midst of suffering. That brother in Christ that I talked about earlier, this man has had a great influence upon me when it comes to evangelism. And the next thoughts or the next three thoughts I'm going to share with you, I, I got them from him and they have stuck with me. And this is what he does all the time. So when it comes to reaching the lost, even in the midst of great suffering, the first simple thing that all of us can do, we can open up our eyes. Open up your eyes and look around and see that there are opportunities everywhere. Now, I realize that we don't have as many opportunities to go to a variety of places wherever we might be, but nonetheless, there are opportunities everywhere. I'm reminded of Jesus as he was speaking to his apostles in John chapter 4. In John chapter 4 and verse 34, Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to accomplish his work. Do you not say there are yet four months and then comes the harvest? Behold, I say to you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. They are white for harvest. Already he who reaps is receiving wages and gathering fruit for life eternal, so that he who sows and he who reaps may rejoice together. For in this case, the saying is true. One sows and another reaps. 
I sent you to reap that for which you have not labored. Others have labored and you have entered into their labor. I love that statement. Lift up your eyes and look on the fields. That's what we need to be doing right now. Even in the midst of great suffering, look around and you will find opportunities to share the word of God. I know a lot of things have changed. A lot of things are now digital. A lot of things are being done on social media and things like that, but there's still opportunities. Maybe you see the friends that you have posting and the fears and the anxiety that they have. Well, that's an opportunity for you to, to initiate a conversation potentially and to talk to them. Look around when you do go to the grocery store or whoever you may talk to or interact with and notice those opportunities. Maybe it's someone in your neighborhood. Maybe it's an opportunity for you to pick up the phone and to talk to them or a family member that you've shared the gospel with in times past. Maybe they haven't been that receptive. Maybe it's an opportunity for you to go back and talk to them again. My point is this, when it comes to evangelism, it, it's not rocket science. There are, there are opportunities everywhere we go. And Lord willing, when things quote unquote get back to normal, you're gonna have even more opportunities. We're gonna have even more opportunities, which means that we need to have our eyes focused on those opportunities. The second thing that all of us can do that is really simple when it comes to reaching the lost, as you look for those opportunities, make sure that you open up your mouth. As we see these opportunities, we can't just let them pass by. I believe this is a great opportunity with all the things that we're experiencing right now to make some inroads, to plant some seeds, to, to reach out to people and to have Bible studies and things like that. But as we look, and look for these opportunities, eventually we're gonna have to say something. We're gonna have to open up our mouth. And I know that can be one of the most challenging things. I think fear is something that often holds us back. But we cannot allow fear, uncertainty, and doubt to cause us not to take action, not even in the midst of suffering. Because we may miss out on some of these opportunities. You know, I think about Moses in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 3 and chapter 4. I know Moses was the most humble man on earth according uh, to one of the passages in the book of uh, Numbers. I believe Numbers chapter 11 or chapter 12. And when God called him to do a great work of leading his people out of bondage, there were a lot of excuses that Moses used. In verse number 11, Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? And he said, certainly I will be with you and this shall be the sign to you that it is I who have sent you when you have brought the people out of Egypt and you shall worship God at this mountain. Moses said, who am I? I, I I'm no one. In verse 13 of chapter three, he said, and behold, I'm going to the sons of Israel and I will say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now they may say, what is his name? What shall I say to them? And he was trying to figure out, okay, if this actually happens, how am I going to respond? God would help him out with that as well. In chapter four and verse number one, Moses said, what if they will not believe me or listen to what I say? For they may say, the Lord has, has not appeared to you. Well, if I, if I go out and do, and do all this, maybe they won't believe me. Maybe they won't listen. I think sometimes we come up with the same excuses, right? As when we think about reaching out to people and talking to people, and yet God is going to take away that excuse from Moses. In verse 10, Moses said to the Lord, please, Lord, I've never been eloquent, neither recently nor in time past, nor since you have spoken to your servant, for I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. I'm just not a good speaker. And then eventually Moses said in verse 13, please, Lord, now send the message by whomever you will, please, anyone else but me. God would say that's enough. The anger of the Lord burned against Moses. And he said, is there not your brother Aaron, the Levite? I know that he speaks fluently. And moreover, behold, he's coming out to meet you. When he sees you, he will be glad in his heart. I wanted to share that example with you because we are eventually going to have to open up our mouth and talk to people when it comes to evangelism. That's what Paul and Silas did when they went to the riverside. That's what Paul did when he cried out to the, uh, the uh, Philippian jailer. That's what Peter and John did. That's what we find. Eventually, we've got to talk to people. We're going to have to reach out to them. And yet fear sometimes can hold us back. What I want you to hold on to, to remember is that we should have great confidence. We are the people of God. We know that the gospel has the power to save. We know that the word of God is true. And I know that fear 
can often get in the way. And I'm reminded of a passage in Acts chapter 18. In Acts chapter 18, when Paul had gone to Corinth, in Acts chapter 18 and verse number 9, in verse number 8, you see that there were many of the Corinthians, they heard, they were believing, and they were baptized. That's what they did to be saved. And then in verse number 9, it's interesting because it says, The Lord said to Paul in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid any longer, but go on speaking, and do not be silent, for I am with you, and no man will attack you in order to harm you, for I have many people in this city. I love this passage because even Paul needed to be reminded do not be afraid. Speak. Go on speaking. And do not be silent, for I am with you. If he needed to be reminded of that, we need to be reminded as well that we have great work to do. And although we may have some fears and anxiety about how people may respond or what they may think about us, you know what's really scary? People dying and not being prepared to stand before God. That's why we need to open up our eyes that's why we need to open up our mouth. That's why we don't have to be afraid. That's why we need to go on speaking and not be silent. Let's, let's begin with people in our home. Let's continue to teach our young children about Jesus and God and who they are and the word of God. We're rejoicing here. Uh, we had a young woman, a young girl here who obeyed the gospel a couple of days ago. And what a blessing that is that her parents taught her God's word along with others. That required them talking and sharing. We all have these opportunities. We can begin in our own household. We can talk to those in our family. And we're, we can look around and talk to a variety of other people. Those things that we can do are simple with respect to, to talking, whether it's putting God into our conversation, sharing with others how we are responding and the blessing that we have with our brothers and sisters in Christ and the strength that we have and knowing how God is in control or sharing different passages from God's word and how, and how God is with us throughout this time. We need to capitalize on these opportunities. That's going to require that we open up our mouth. We open up our eyes. We open up our mouth. And another way, let me just say this, many congregations are having as sermons that are being presented on their website, there is another opportunity for you to share with someone, an opportunity for them to hear the word of God. And so those are opportunities that are available at this very moment. And after all of this passes, we still need to open up our eyes and open up our mouth. And eventually, the third thing that we're going to have to do, eventually we're going to have to, well, we're going to have to open up our Bible. I know we may not be able to meet with someone at Starbucks or Panera Bread or in an office to have that one-on-one -on -one Bible study, but there are so many different kinds of resources that we have online, whether it's Zoom or we can have a face-to-face -face via the computer. I've had some Bible studies already through Zoom. And so as we have these studies and as we talk to people and look for those opportunities, eventually we have to open up the Word of God. And I know people often say, well, where do I begin when somebody actually wants to have a Bible study? Where am I gonna begin and how, where do I start? Well, start with Jesus. Tell them the story of Jesus. That's a great place to begin. You'll never go wrong when you do that. Open up your eyes, open up your mouth, open up your Bible. I remember years ago, and I've shared this story with a lot of people. I was at the gym when I work out. Uh, I like just to get my workout in. I don't want to really talk to a lot of people. But there was a brother in Christ there, and he asked me if I could go over and talk to this guy who was working out. And so I asked him, well, what's the guy's name? And, and he said, I don't know his name. So that, that kind of made me a little bit nervous. And then when I looked over and talked, went over to the guy, uh, he was about six foot eight. He's doing squats. And I mean, that was a little bit intimidating as well. But I, I told him, I said, listen, my name is Benjamin Lee. And I have a Bible study that I'd love to share with you. It could change your life. Would you like to hear it? And he actually said, yes. To which, you know, I responded in shock. Really? You really want to hear this? Uh, I, was, I had some shock when he actually said yes. Because I wasn't assuming that he was going to say yes. So I actually wasn't able to study with him. Another brother was able to study with him. Uh, and eventually he obeyed the gospel. And his wife, a year later, obeyed the gospel. I'm sharing that one story. There's many other stories. But I'm sharing that one because... My, uh, my brother in Christ opened up his eyes and then he opened up his mouth to tell me to go talk to that person. 
and then someone else open up their Bible to share God's word with him. Even in the midst of difficult days, in the midst of uncertainty, we still can do the work of God. And it could often be the case that many people, their minds, their hearts are more receptive to God's word at this very moment, which is why we need to take action. Our Father in heaven, he is with us. The word of God, it is true. So let's make sure that we seek out these opportunities. I will close with this. As you think about evangelism in the midst of suffering, it often is an unusual response, but all of us can still do it. All of us can do simple things. I'll just share one more thought with you. All of us can pray, and hopefully we've been praying a lot. Let's remember what Paul said in Colossians chapter 4, that let's pray to, pray to God that a door, door of opportunity might be opened in Colossians chapter 4. Paul said this, he said in verse number 2, devote yourselves to prayer, keep an alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God will open to us a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have also been imprisoned. Let's pray that doors of opportunity will continue to be there. And let's pray that we'll have that courage to walk through those doors of opportunity. We have work to do. Yes, even in these challenging days, we have work to do. We will be successful. Our Father in heaven is with us. Let's do his work and focus more on his power and less on our problems. And let's give people what they truly need. Hope, salvation, confidence. And one day they can be in heaven with their God, with our God, and with his son, Jesus Christ. It's been said that suffering doesn't make a person unique. What makes a person unique is how they respond to suffering. Let's be like those Christians in the first century who responded with great faith and relied upon their God in heaven and continued to share the good news of Jesus Christ. Take care and God bless. everyone. I'm Lance inside CEI Bookstore and Truth Publications. I want to take a minute to talk to you today about communion supplies and serving the communion. As everybody is worried about the virus that's going around, and rightfully so, I know many of you are working to try to find a way to worship and uh, to partake of the communion in a way that's sanitary and best uh, for your members. And we want to help you do that and show you some resources that we have and uh, also give you some uh, insights that have been shared with us from different customers around uh, the country as well. First of all, we have made an effort to stock more of the pre-filled communion cup juice and wafer options uh, for you, and so this might be a good option for your congregation. The pre-filled cup comes with uh, a top layer cellophane that peels back to reveal the wafer of bread, and then the second level would peel back to open to the juice, and so this may be uh, a great option for you to keep them in individual packs for your individual members. We have those in boxes of 100, also boxes of 30, and then small boxes uh, such as these, boxes of 6. And uh, we'd invite you to go to truthbooks.com, go to the communion supplies under church supplies, and uh, make your order for any of those options uh, that would best suit you there. And I want to also let you know that we're having a hard time keeping up with orders for these particular uh, items, especially the pre-filled ones. So please be patient with us, but go ahead and put your orders in. We're 
filling those orders on a first come first serve basis whether it be by phone in store or online so go ahead and get your orders in the queue and then as we get the stock in and can get it sent out in an orderly fashion we're fulfilling those as quickly as we can another great idea that's been shown to us and we know many of you have used is by using the resources you probably already have uh, in a serving tray like this and the individual cups that normally would contain just the juice but many of you have found that actually putting a piece of bread for each individual member uh, in the individual cups works as well as a nice way to keep everyone from touching uh, the bread itself and then you can space it out on the trays it may take a little more use of trays to do that uh, but that's a great idea that's been shared with us and we wanted to share that with you. The bread that we currently have in stock is the Matzo's Unsalted and uh, we have these in, in boxes as you see here. We're working to get other bread options in stock so keep looking online at truthbooks.com under the communion supplies uh, for that. The individual cups uh, come in large packs like these, these individual cups and, and this would be the most economical way for you to divide out your communion and serve it in a way that uh, works for your membership so be sure you check that out uh, as well. We just want to help you in any way we can so don't hesitate to give us a call, uh, send us an email, uh, place your orders again online and we'll work with you in every way we can. Don't forget to to look in the communion supplies for items like these, the, the cup fillers uh, that can help you filling your cups and be sure that you do that in the most sanitary way that you can. And uh, just once again, I want to ask for your patience with us as we strive to fulfill these orders. We want to help you. We're here, we're here to serve you. Uh, but uh, it is a little bit of a difficult time for us to uh, get everything in and meet the demand that is out there. If you've got great ideas other than these or along with these to, to share with us, then comment, email us, give us a phone call. We'd like to know what you're doing to uh, help serve your congregation, and uh, we'll in turn try to share that information back out and, and help in any way that we can. So again, visit us at truthbooks.com. Continue to place your orders. Understand that some of those items may show to only be a pre-order status, and we're doing that because we're staging those orders, first come, first serve, and uh, trying to get those out to you just as quickly and timely as possible. Uh, I'm Lance Taylor again for CEI Bookstore and Truth Publications. Thank you for being our customers. Thank you for your patience. Uh, we wish you the very best in the days to come and uh, hope that you'll continue to shop with us in store and online at truthbooks.com.